Hi, this is Janet Swanson. I am here today to encourage you, inspire you, and cheer you on, and to let you know you deserve to be happy, to be healed, and to live your life in freedom, free from the pain of your past, free from fear, free from all those voices that tell you, I can't. So let's break the silence and expose the darkness that has held you in confinement way too long. Your life matters. Your story matters. Your voice matters. I believe in you. And most of all, God believes in you. Welcome to One Voice Makes a Difference podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to One Voice Podcast. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. And I have a special guest with me today. Her name is Allison Lusted, and she lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Is it Atlanta or Duluth? Yes, I live in the outskirts of Atlanta in Duluth. All right, so I was correct both times. So. <laughs> Allison Lusted is a dear friend of mine, and uh, we first met at a conference here in Statesboro that she and her husband were here for a little while, but I just got to know her. She was in our church for a little while and she's also a missionary and she just does, she wears all kinds of hats, but she has a very, very, very powerful story and we have a lot in common. So today we just wanna bring recognition to um, childhood abuse and sexual abuse, rape, molestation, trauma as children, what it does to us in the adult stages, and how the church deals with all this. For such a long time, the church didn't talk about it, did they, Allison? No, not at all. Yeah, it's just silent, you know, and we, we tend to run from the things that we don't understand, or we sweep it under the rug, and we pretend like it didn't happen, and then we ask God to heal us, but we don't want to really deal with it, God. We don't want to deal with the trauma or deal with the shame and the guilt. And especially when it comes to molestation and if it happened in the church or if it happened in our families, it just brings shame. So as kids, it's hard to talk about and it's hard to tell somebody. But today we want to uncover those things that have been in the dark and bring light to it. and um, to to give people hope and to inspire them to come out of the darkness and tell their stories. And not only that, just to um, bring light to the darkness of where the enemy wants you to stay in a place of despair. And when you stay in that place, you just remain unhealed and Jesus wants to heal us. So I'm just going to ask Allison, first of all, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're doing. I know you have something called the Sela Retreat. You're also a counselor and a missionary. Gosh, what else do you do? You do so much stuff. <laughs> well, the most important thing I do is, is I am a daughter of the King. Mm -hmm. I, am a, I am his beloved, and I just am so grateful to have a heavenly father that is absolutely perfect and that loves me and that has redeemed me and changed me. And he is continuing to change me every year more into the image of his son, Jesus. Mm. But secondly, um, I'm a wife of an amazing man who played a little bit of professional baseball back in the day. And he's still wow. doing that today. He's coaching wow. and doing private instruction. And then I think my third claim to fame is four of the most precious little grandchildren in the whole world. So they keep me really busy. In fact, a couple of them are here right now. I'm just praying they don't come bursting through the room and, and make their entrance <laughs> into the podcast. <laughs> oh, so you're a grandmother, a mother, a wife, and yes, a yes. child of the, the king, you know. Absolutely. That's yes, awesome. I have four children. And yeah, on a daily basis, um, I do do trauma resolution therapy. So I'm a counselor and I'm doing that pretty much all day, every day. But for the last 20 years, um, God had called us to the mission field and we would take teams on short-term missions all over the world. So our, our mandate from heaven was to win souls. Mm -hmm. And so everywhere we went, whether we were scrubbing toilets or preaching the gospel mm -hmm. our motive was to introduce jesus and mm -hmm. and lead people into uh, a relationship with god through him 
So it wasn't until about five years ago that God added to our vision. Now it's not just win souls, but he says, I also want you to help make them whole. Mm -hmm. So that's where the counseling comes in. And that's where five years ago, my husband and I started having Selah retreats, which really foster a lot of inner healing and just refreshing and rest and encountering the love of God. So those three things, missions, counseling, and retreats, and grandkids. <laughs> mm -hmm, that's powerful. <laughs> <me> quite busy. <laughs> that's amazing. And, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've walked with you through a lot of things in life. We've been on mission trips together, yeah. and we've preached together, and I've had the honor to lead worship behind you when you were preaching to 15,000 people in Peru. Ooh. <laughs> awesome, wasn't it? <laughs> no, I'll never forget that. I was singing, playing the piano, and leading worship all in Spanish. That was a challenge for me in my second Wow. <laughs> Favorite worship leaders. Oh. You and my daughter, too, was there, right? Elena. That's right. Elena, yeah. She was yes. with me and her husband, so it was it was oh, a lot of fun. So good. And so I've had the, the privilege and the honor to know you for many years and just hear your story and hear all that God has brought you through. And when I hear you preach the gospel, you preach with such passion that it's with um, the knowledge, knowing this woman has experienced God. She's just not mm -hmm. doing this for a job or a career. You have really had an encounter with the Lord. And um, I want our listeners to hear how you got to this place with God, because yeah. a lot of people will look at you and say, oh, well, she's never been through anything. She doesn't. And people will look at me and say the same thing. Gosh, you look like you got it all together. You're so confident on the stage. You know, you've never been through anything. And I'm like, oh, if you only knew. Yeah. And that's when my book came out, One Voice and Telling My Story. And I know that you have written a book, too. And what's the name of your book? It's called Ready or Not, and it has 10 contrasting ways that Jesus will find us when he meets us face to face. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. And yeah. I think people need to read this book because it's powerful. And um, if somebody wanted to get your book, where would they get it from right now? They could go to our website. It's uh, crosspointmissions.org. Awesome. Awesome. So that's a good read, but it tells a little bit of her story in that. Mm -hmm. And, but I want her to just share a little bit of her story. Cause when I went to the Selah retreat this last time, um, actually one voice, um, we have a campaign called, um, one voice makes a difference hashtag tell somebody. And so our goal is to, um, bring healing to teenagers and um, bring a word of encouragement to them and those in their 20s or just anybody whoever has an ear to hear mm. you know and to hear what the lord has to say we want to pray that um, we can bring healing to them through our stories and um and inspire them you know mm. to to tell somebody if they're being abused or um if something is going on in your life that's shameful and you and the shame and the guilt of all of it, you know, we want to inspire you to tell somebody. But um, as I have went through this, the high schools and I'm talking to students, I realized that that's all great and that's good, but it's not enough. They needed counseling and they needed ongoing counseling mm -hmm. because this generation and even the generation, gosh, we all have needed healing. Mm -hmm. But our generation, nobody talked about it. And you just had to get it the best way that you could. You, nobody right. did counseling. Nobody, you know, if you did that, you were crazy. You were considered mm -hmm. crazies. You know, exactly. only crazy people get counseling, right? That's right. Crazy. It's changing today. Today, it's have you had counseling yet? Yeah, it's the total opposite. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. oh gosh, I love it. Well, so now we can do that, you know. Um, and we have the open door. So we've been partnering with with Allison. So I, I took a bunch of kids to the sale retreat. Yeah. And, and sponsored that and was so happy to do that. But I got to hear even uh, in detail more of Allison's story, more than I had ever heard. And I want you just to share that with us a little bit. You yourself, you've been through some, some trauma as sure. a teenager. 
And when people look at you right now, they would think, oh, she's never been through anything. But when I heard you tell your story and how it really ministered to these kids, I want the whole world to hear it. So I hope this podcast go, it goes all over the world. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And let me just say, Janet, I appreciate your ministry, One Voice, so much. I would have given anything if you had come to my high school and talked to us mm. because nobody... I never even thought about telling somebody the things that I went through. I just mm -hmm. thought you weren't supposed to do that. You were supposed mm -hmm. to keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. So I just am so thankful that you are getting out there and sharing your story and, and kids are really coming forward mm -hmm. with the abuse they've gone through. So they don't have to carry it for so many years into their adulthood right. before they finally tell somebody like I did. Mm -hmm. So I was raised by two wonderful people but neither one of them were Christians. They didn't go to church. And so my grandmother took me to church and I ended up receiving Christ at five years old. And I really knew what I was doing. I believe I was born again when I was five. And then at 12 years old, I rededicated my life um, and just really reconnected to the Lord. And I was on fire. I was on fire for God at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And you know what? So was Jesus. I just thought about that. You know, mm -hmm. we should not discount a child's relationship with God. That's right. Because even Jesus himself was sitting in the temple, you know, at 12. <laughs> yeah, at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So at 12 years old, I rededicated and just really was you know, preaching to empty chairs and to wow. my dolls and to anybody that would listen to me, I was reading the Bible. I loved Jesus with all my heart. And then a couple of years later, when I was 14 years old, um, I was just very naive, a very sweet girl who loved Jesus, but I had no discipleship really. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really being mentored or taken care of spiritually. So I ended up looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. And this young man who was the quarterback of the football team uh, really captured my attention. Mm -hmm. And when he invited me to come to a, I, I, guess, I guess it was a party at his house um, because his parents were out of town and a bunch of kids were going to gather at his house to just watch movies all night and just, you know, eat popcorn and just have a good time. We were only 14 years old. So uh, at 14, I actually lied to my mother and I told her that I was spending the night with a girlfriend. And so she dropped me off at this boy's townhome and I, and she drove away. And I knocked on the door with my little suitcase and he opened the door and there was no one else there. So I asked him where everybody was and he said, oh, they'll be here soon. Just come on in. We're going to, you and I are going to have a little competition before they get here. And I'm very competitive. And I thought, oh yeah, what are we going to do? And he said, I've got these two tumblers full of juice and we're just going to see who can drink it the fastest. And so I thought, oh, I am going to put you down, boy. I'm going to drink that orange juice faster than you are. Mm. And uh, he counted to three. We both began to drink that drink. And I downed the entire drink. Um, and when I did, I realized that it wasn't juice. And really, to this day, I don't know what it was. I had never had alcohol in my life. Um, I know that it had to have alcohol in it. I'm sure it was probably orange juice and vodka, but I also think there was some kind of drug in there because mm -hmm. I've never experienced anything like that before or since. And the whole room began to spin and I, I could not stand. I had to fall to the ground. And when I did, this young boy that I had such a crush on and thought it was an innocent night of watching movies, he began to pick me up, put me on a bed and take all of my clothes off. Mm -hmm. And then he began to just violently rape me. And there was absolutely nothing I could do. My mama picked me up the next day. And uh, I just remember actually crying the whole drive home. And she never even noticed. 
She didn't feel the heaviness in the car. She didn't ask me any questions about the night. Um, I just remember thinking, uh, I hope no one ever, ever, ever finds out about what happened to me. Mm. And um, I just went on about my life and yet I was forever changed. Wow. So about two weeks later, um, this young man had told a lot of people what he had done to me. It was almost like I was a trophy and he was so proud of himself. And one of the people that he told was my cousin, who my cousin and I were best friends. I mean, since we were little kids, we were all spending the night at each other's houses and doing things together every weekend. And I completely trusted my cousin. Right. And a couple of weeks later, we had, you know, the families had been together and I ended up spending the night at my cousin's house and we were the only two upstairs. He was in his room. I was in a guest room and his parents slept on the main floor. And in the middle of the night, this cousin comes into the room and literally threatens my life and begins to, again, uh, violently rape me. Wow. But this time I was very coherent you know, and I knew exactly what was happening. And I, it was extremely painful. Uh, I wanted to scream, but I was honestly, I saw something in his eyes that just told me that I just better keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And um, he finished and I cried myself to sleep that night. And again, it changed me forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what I have learned as a trauma resolution therapist is trauma is defined as anything that happens to you that compromises your values and causes you pain and loss. Mm -hmm. And so these were two very traumatic events for me. And when you go through a trauma, it actually impacts your physical brain. Your wow. brain is stimulated. And depending on the severity of the trauma, your brain actually shifts and neurons are destroyed in the brain. Mm. And your brain pretty much stays damaged mm. until the trauma is resolved. Then as you resolve trauma, which very, very rarely happens, but if you can get the trauma resolved within you, your brain, physical brain, can actually be healed, and new neuropathways can be formed in the brain. Wow. So it's scientifically proven that resolving trauma heals the brain. Wow. Is, isn't that great news? Yes, it is. And that's what you've been doing to so many people, and you have the passion to do it, but the compassion on top of that, because you've been through that. Mm -hmm. And you know what it feels like to be traumatized and yet you can't say anything and you know um, firsthand the fear that you face and, you know, the shame that's behind it. Will anybody believe me? You know, it was my cousin mm -hmm. and then the football player is telling everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and he thinks it's a, a good thing, but he raped me. He didn't have permission. He crossed a line. He crossed a boundary. And, you know, I have found too, Allison, that when boundaries are crossed at a young age and somehow they keep getting crossed as an adult because it was never dealt with in our teenage years or in our childhood that, okay, you just crossed a boundary and you hurt me you abused me, you did something very bad to me. Mm -hmm. And then as we get older, if we don't get that resolution, somehow we'll end up crossing boundaries with other people looking for some kind of resolution. Absolutely. And then being angry because they crossing boundaries with us again. Yes. So that's where the sale retreat comes in and, and then the ongoing counseling too. But I'm, I'm curious, what happened after that? Did you ever tell anybody what happened or did you just put it back in the, 
the doors of your heart and you locked it and you threw the key away and you thought, well, I'm just going to go on. It's a great question. I actually did not tell a soul uh, for almost 10 years. I think I was 23. We actually did an abused women's conference in Lima, Peru. Mm -hmm. And I told my testimony from the pulpit. I'd never told anyone but my husband. Mm -hmm. And the women were so touched that it actually helped heal me (laughs) more than them probably just you know Janet when we hold something in secret Mm -hmm. anything in the darkness has power over us Mm -hmm. but once it's brought to the light by you not by the boy that did it but once Mm -hmm. I brought it to the light it lost its power over me so because I kept it a secret there are what we call in the counseling world survivor responses to trauma and people choose different ways to respond or to survive their pain Mm -hmm. and it led me personally into a a promiscuous lifestyle Mm -hmm. 14 to to 20 when I received Mm -hmm. the baptism of the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. it all stopped but wow you do you you lose your boundaries uh you feel like and you know when someone doesn't tell something they carry shame and shame actually keeps you in your sin. Mm. It's not until you tell somebody that you're relieved of the shame and that uh, you don't continue the cycle of sin and behavior, you know, as a result of that trauma. And that is so, so correct because it is, it's a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. It's like it's never stopping and you have to do something to break that cycle. And that's where I think, you know, breaking those generational curses over our lives and, and Mm -hmm. even over our families. So when you say something and you bring it to the light, not only were you breaking it over your life, but you're breaking it over your children's life. Oh man. Because you start, when you hold those things in darkness and you never tell anybody, nobody knows what you've gone through, then it's passed down. Your children will inherit that. The word says it will be passed on to them. And somewhere that cycle has to be broken. So I think the, the first step is by breaking the silence, you know, Mm -hmm. and coming out of the darkness and coming out of that shame and realize that Jesus died. He, he bore the guilt. He bore the shame, not just of my sin, but of the trauma of my sin, the pain that sin has caused. Mm -hmm. And what happened to you was not your fault. You were innocent in that, you know, Mm -hmm. and, but it was sin that led you there because the first, the thing that you hid was, I don't want my mom to know. Mm-hmm. And anytime you go, Oh, I don't want somebody to know. We probably need to go, well, why don't I want them to know that there's something not right about yes. that? I knew what I was doing was wrong. I should never have gone to a boy's house to spend the night, you know? Yeah. I knew well, that was sin. You did it in an innocent way, though, thinking that you never thought this would have happened. No, but that's no, just the way no. sin is. Sin never yeah. tells you what's going to happen. It just that's wants right. to you in it. It always and, costs more. Yes. Think. Yeah, and it always leads you further than you think you would ever own. That's it. And, you know, I have often told people this, that, you know, yes, God has plans for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know I plans that I have for you, thus saith the Lord, and they are to give you a good hope. I'm a good future and full of hope, you know, and that you may have life. And that's, that's what God has done. But the word says also that the enemy has a plan. He has Mm. a strategy. He has a, uh, and it's the same old thing that he's done. He's a deceiver. You know, he is always planting lies inside of you and, and inside of us, you know, And we believe those lies and somewhere we have to um, say no to the plans of the enemy and say yes to the plans of God. So uh, along, how long did it take you where you realized, Hey, I, I'm in this vicious cycle. I'm ready to stop this cycle 
and, and uh, say yes to God 100% because you had had an encounter with God at 12 years old and you had given your heart mm -hmm. to him at five, but then you had been through life, you know, and mm -hmm. life was not very kind to you. So wh when did that vicious cycle stop? And you said, okay, God, here I am. I'm just going to give you everything. Yes, that happened to me on actually April 22nd, 1980. Mm. Um, I really surrendered my whole life to, to God and I was uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's talked about in Acts chapter one by Jesus. Mm -hmm. It happened uh, when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter two. But yes, I just, I yielded everything mm -hmm. to the Lord when I was 20. But I still was not healed of the trauma of my past. I had uh, still had that secret inside of me and I carried it um, into my marriage. And it wasn't until I married that I shared that with my husband, but I still wasn't healed even after I shared it with my husband. Mm. So I continued to carry that inside of me well into my thirties. Mm. And in my thirties, you got busy working for God instead okay. of with God. Mm. Okay, so it was all about me just running ahead, ninety miles an hour. I was teaching three or four different Bible studies a week in different neighborhoods. I was preaching on Wednesday nights, sometimes even on Sunday mornings. There were times I would be teaching seven times a week. Wow! And taking people on these mission trips and leading worship in my local church, on staff at my local church. I was so uh, consumed with ministry mm -hmm. that it, it really became an idol in my life. And it was the most important thing. And I would run home and I would do the kids and do my husband and do what was necessary just so that I could get back into the ministry mm -hmm. that God had called me to. And my life got very out of balance and unhealthy and the secret was still deep within me mm -hmm. through all of that um and god just is so amazing he's the alpha he's the omega he sees the whole picture the beginning and the end mm -hmm. and he um i had gotten to a place in my ministry where i had become prideful but i really didn't know i was prideful i thought i was fine Mm -hmm. I thought everything was good in mm -hmm. me. It seemed like everything I was touching was turning to gold. We had soup kitchens in third world countries and orphanages and an abused women's shelter and just everything was just going so well. And I didn't realize how much pride had come into me mm -hmm. until someone at the church on staff did something very unethical. And I remember really judging that person. I, I was so shocked, number one, that a pastor could do what this pastor did. Mm -hmm. And it made me so angry that out of my mouth, you know, without even thinking about what I was saying, I said, you know, I, I'm not perfect, but I would never <laughs> do what he did. <laughs> yeah. I really judged him. And yeah. the Bible, of course, warns us about judging. And mm -hmm. the same measure that I dealt out to him actually came back to me. Wow. And the Lord said, you know, I love you too much, Allison, to let you go through life thinking you're all that, <laughs> that you're just fine because you're not, you know, wow. everything you judge in other people is actually in you. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, he took me by the hand. And he led me into the wilderness mm -hmm. to humble me and test me and show me what was in my heart. And it was not pretty. Mm. That's Deuteronomy 8 verse 2. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus, that's what God did with the Israelites. Mm -hmm. to Show them what was in their hearts. Because mm -hmm. if we don't humble ourselves, God will humble us. He yes, he will. Much not to. Yes, so, yes. And that's not easy. It's very painful. Oh, my goodness. 
Um, because you never know what's in your heart till God shows you what's in it. I think that's why David prayed, Lord, God, whatever's in my heart, things that I don't even know that's there, show me, create in me a clean heart that's pure before you. And, and so many people think they have already arrived. You know, I'm a Christian, I'm preaching, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, people are getting saved and delivered and I've arrived. And I think that's a very dangerous place to be. The, I think the thing that David had going for him is he realized he never arrived. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Especially after he failed, you know, and, and, you know, the Bible says a good man will fall seven times, but he keeps getting back up. Oh, amen. <laughs> so, so he, he took you by the hand and he led you through a wilderness. He loved you so much that he led you through the wilderness to show you what was in your heart. So what happened after that? I mean, because on the other side of a wilderness is destiny is the promised land. So it was something else better on the other side. Yes. And I love what you said that he led me through it. You didn't camp out there. You didn't build a house there. <laughs> Even in the 23rd Psalm, it always talks about he leads me yeah. by, paths, uh, by the still waters and through paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But yea, though I mm. walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. Yeah. And it, 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 it became more of a, of an eye journey into this, uh, season, this wilderness season. You know, when Jesus was walking with Peter, he revealed to Peter that Satan had asked to sift him as wheat. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but if I was walking with Jesus and he said, right. no, don't let him sift me, Jesus, tell yeah. him no, tell him no. But Jesus <laughs> didn't say that. Mm. Yeah, Jesus didn't tell the devil no. <laughs> right. In fact, uh, Jesus told Peter, he said, I'm praying for you that your mm. faith fail not. Mm. And I believe Jesus is actually still interceding that exact prayer for all of us today. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jesus says to Peter, and when you have turned, strengthen your brethren. Mm. So Jesus knew Mm -hmm. that Peter was going to deny him three times. Yeah. Jesus knew that he was going to be sifted, mm -hmm. but that there would come a time when Peter would repent mm -hmm. and he would cry out with godly sorrow to the Lord mm -hmm. and that he would be restored. And that right after he would be restored, he would preach one of the greatest sermons of all time in mm -hmm. Acts chapter two mm -hmm. and thousands of people would get saved. Yes. So that's kind of what happened to me. Um, mm -hmm. In that wilderness season, Satan lured me off the path uh, into a place of pride. And where pride is, there is always a fall. Mm -hmm. And I did. I fell deep into a pit uh, of sin, mm -hmm. wanting to please my authorities more than I wanted to please God. Mm -hmm. You know, I got all my affirmation from my authority. I was at a place where I still had this secret inside of me and the mm -hmm. enemy knew my secret. Yeah. The enemy knew the kind of life I lived from mm -hmm. 14 to 20. So he knew the right buttons to push in me. Mm -hmm. And he lured me into uh, an affair mm -hmm. during that wilderness season. And it was so deceiving. Mm -hmm. and so painful. Um, and during that time, I was still teaching the Bible. I was mm -hmm. still leading worship. I was still taking people on the mission field. How in the heck do you do that at the same time that you're having an affair? Wow. Well, I, I completely understand it because you deceive yourself mm -hmm. and you just, you think, okay, I did something really bad. I'm just going to repent, cleanse myself by the power of the blood mm -hmm. and lead worship and go on. We'll keep that a secret. Not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to cleanse myself and go on. Mm -hmm. And I must have done that. I don't know, many times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thinking that I'll be okay this time. I'll cleanse myself this time. I'm never going to do that again. And then eventually I would fall again and again and again. Mm. And again, when you keep something in the darkness, it has power over you. Yeah. 
and I didn't know how to get out. I was completely trapped in a pit of despair. And I would have despaired if I had not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord at mm -hmm. some point. And I cried out to him from my pit yeah. for help. Wow. So what happened? How did you get out of that pit? Well, I'd love to tell you that I confessed my sin and uh, <laughs> came out, of, came out, you know, publicly, but I didn't. I kept thinking that I was strong enough to handle it by myself. Mm -hmm. And God has not created us to be an island and mm -hmm. to handle our problems alone. Right. It's like your ministry was developed. That is the heart of God. Tell somebody yeah. that is the heart of God. And I didn't tell anybody and God loved me too much to leave me in that pit. Mm. So he actually exposed my sin, mm. which I had already given him permission to do in yeah. my prayers, crying out for help. I, I said, do whatever it takes, God, I can't, yeah. I can't keep doing this. And he did. He exposed it. Um, and then immediately, uh, I began going to counseling. I did two different kinds of counseling at that time. And one was a psychologist that, you know, counseled me on think about what you think about. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly uh, cognitive stuff. And then the other counselor I went to was more spiritual, broke generational curses, mm -hmm. um, you know, did inner healing on me. Mm -hmm. And then by the mercy of God, right there in that season, he picked us up and moved us to Statesboro. <laughs> and that's when I met you. <laughs> that's when you met me. I was a mess. <laughs> oh, God. But I just loved you so much. <laughs> well, I tell you, you were a big part of, you and Carrie both were a big part of our restoration process. And we just continually thank God for you forever. Wow. Because you did love us. You knew our story and you still loved us and trusted God in us. You never judged us. And um, so we, we really attribute a lot of our restoration and that healing time to you and Carrie and Crossroads Community Church. Well, it was crazy because when you guys came to our church, the Lord was in the process of healing me. <sighs> and... Uh, the Lord was showing me things that was in my heart and my potential to sin and my potential of um, arrogance and pride, you know? Mm -hmm. So the Lord was uh, dealing with me about this one place in my heart that I had shut the door to and threw the key away and and I also had idols and, but I had an issue with abandonment, you know? So while, while you came, the Lord was healing me of abandonment. Mm. And what happens is when God begins to heal you of something, he, people will like, for me, he was healing me of abandonment. So people were leaving me right and left. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, we had a hundred people to leave the church and yeah. then the accusations came and my husband became the pastor of the church then because his dad was the pastor before. And then people would make crazy comments like your wife is too sexy to be a pastor's wife. I'm like, what? Where did that come from? I mean, I was the music pastor here for years before and now all of a sudden I'm too sexy. I didn't know if that was a compliment or... <laughs> You know, I'm like, what are you guys talking about? And I began to be angry. And, but I was like you, I was still preaching and still doing stuff and um, just trying to survive. I didn't even know there was an inner healing. Mm. I didn't even know God wanted me to be healed. And so he exposed this issue of abandonment that I had and, and allowed people to walk away from us. And he, you know, um, uh, every area of our life was attacked at that time. So when I met you, I was so broken. I didn't have any room to judge. <laughs> I was like, there's no judging on this part because we're all in this thing together. We're the body. Man. Christ, how can the hand say to the other hand, I don't need you and you judge it? Or how can mm -hmm. the hand say to the foot, I don't need you. And you want to judge that foot because 
it stumped its toe or something, you know? And, and as a matter of fact, when one part of the body feels pain, the, what happens in our natural body is we run to that area. When I stump my toe, guess what? Everything stops around me. I yep. begin to scream. My mouth begins to confess what just happened to the big toe, you know, yes. and my hands go to that big toe and it begins to comfort it. And, you know, the word talks about like the body of Christ is like our body. We're meant to bring comfort to one another. When yes. one hurts, we run to it and we comfort it. And because we're all broken people. We all have so much brokenness and, and Jesus was broken for us. You That's know? Right. And yeah. when we realize that and we let that pride go and I'll never forget that I finally came to the place, God, if it's just me and you, I'm okay. If everybody leaves me, I thought my husband was going to leave me. Mm. It was just a seed that the enemy planted in my heart. It wasn't for real. Uh, the enemy kept saying, your husband doesn't love you. Your kids don't love you. The church doesn't love you. Your life is not important. Mm. You're not important. And I was like, and I was so like, so deceived, but yet I was believing those lies, but yet I was so, I was just hurting Allison and yes. I was looking for God. And for whatever reason, God seemed a million miles away a million miles away. But the only thing I had going for me at that time was worship. I felt the closest to him mm -hmm. when I was worshiping him. And so many times when I couldn't pray and I couldn't preach. And I said, I told my husband, I said, I just can't preach anymore. Not right now. I, I never lost my praise. And I think that's what kept me. Mm -hmm. It was true. It was sincere. It was out front and I kept putting my heart out there. God, if it's just you and me, I'm staying right here. If Amen. everybody decides to walk away, I'm staying right here. Wow. And it took a while, you know, but God began to even heal me. When you arrived here, there was just no room for judgment. And I think a lot of people, a lot of pastors, you know, they have not been broken enough to let God lead them in down that wilderness. Therefore they judge and it does, it does come back to us. So yeah. it, when you came, you were such um, a beautiful person to me. I just fell in love with you and, uh -huh. and I longed to see God heal you yeah. and invited you to come be a part of our church and to be a part of the healing. And out of that, I don't know. We didn't ask God for it. We didn't, we didn't even know that this house would be a house of healing that people would just come and ministers would come and just sit under us for a year and be healed and then leave and go pastor yeah. a church somewhere. And <laughs> I, that happened more times than I can tell you, you know, oh, my goodness. so when I met you, uh, we, we formed this bond, this, we, immediately just felt like we were sisters, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you came to church here, your husband, and you worked with us on staff and the Lord just began to heal you. So after, while you were here and the healing process took place, God, this is, this is just me looking in from the outside. I'm now seeing God uh, restore everything that the canker worm, <laughs> everything that the devil stole from you. He restored your marriage. Yeah. He's not giving you a ministry. I bet the devil regrets every day he laid hands upon you because I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> when you wake up in the morning he goes, Oh no, she's up. <laughs> I hope you're right. <laughs> oh yes, I know it. And you're you're just bringing so much healing to people now. Mm. So um as we wrap this story up a little bit, Allison, you, you came here and you went through counseling and you went to a retreat and you just sat back and you just let God heal you. Is that what happened? Absolutely. He, he put so many different healing people into my life. Uh, down there in Statesboro, again, I was going to two different counselors sitting under you. 
Um, and then I had looked all over the internet for a retreat and could not find one. I finally found something. I know there's hundreds out there, but I finally found one in Colorado, but it was so expensive. It was $5,000 mm -hmm. for my husband and I to go just for a long weekend. And there was no way we could do that. In fact, I hung up the phone very discouraged. When we shared that with a group of people that we had just met in Statesboro, really didn't know any of these people, one of the couples in that group uh, talked together and decided to send Chuck and I to a retreat that they had been to. Mm. It really had healed their marriage. And they told us, we'd like to send you guys to a retreat that we went to that helped us. And of course, Chuck and I were all on board. We'll go anywhere you want to send us. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much. Well, it turns out that we had to buy a plane ticket to Colorado, mm. the same place that I had found on the internet. This couple sent us and paid the $5,000 wow. for us to go to that retreat. Wow. And that's where, uh, that's where the Selah retreats that we're doing today, mm -hmm. that's where it was conceived in our hearts. Mm. And we offered up a prayer to God that we need more retreats like this mm -hmm. that aren't so expensive, not $5,000. Right. And that add um, the Holy Spirit, because it really wasn't a spirit-filled retreat, but it, God still used it mm -hmm. in a powerful way. Mm -hmm. Well, seven whole years went by after that prayer, mm -hmm. and, and then God deposited in our hearts. Remember when you prayed that you would like to do retreats for people? Mm -hmm. and I was like, yes, sir. I knew his voice. And he said, well, the time is now. Mm. And so that was 2015, and we've been hosting those retreats ever since, and we have just seen God do miracles wow. in people at those retreats, inner healing, mm -hmm. deliverance, and refreshing and rest, but I'm telling you, the greatest thing that happens to every single person who comes is there is a personal encounter with the love mm -hmm. of God. That's, that's amazing, Allison. And I've been there, I've seen it. And um, that's the reason One Voice wants to partner with you. And we want to send people to the Selah retreat. So to send one person to the, the Selah retreat is $550, right? That's right. That, that's all inclusive. That's three nights of lodging, all the meals. That's one hour of private counseling. It's all the snacks, all the materials, all the gifts, mm -hmm. it includes everything. It's really a, a good price for what they're going to get. Yes. And, and it's powerful. It really, they really experience the Holy Spirit. They yes. experience the power of God and they get just good counseling. Uh, let me just say this. Um, people say, well, you know, I'd really like to go to that retreat, but first I feel like I just kind of need to get my life cleaned up and get right with God and, <laughs> and then I'll go there. Right. And we just want to say, no, please just come just like you are. It yes. doesn't matter. If, it doesn't matter. We've had someone come who didn't, weren't even sure they believed in God. Yeah. So come just like you are. And he loves you so much. He won't leave you that way. That's he'll, right. he'll clean your life up. Mm -hmm. He'll help you change. That's right. And we just invite anyone who just wants to encounter the love of God to come and spend the weekend with us. So this retreat is for people. If you've been through trauma, if you've been through childhood sexual abuse, if your marriage is in trouble, um, Chuck and Allison have been used powerfully by God. Um, to heal other people's marriages. And um, one part that Allison didn't tell in the story, and we don't have a whole lot more time to talk about it, but God put a love back in her heart for her husband. Yes, he and did. <laughs> isn't that wonderful? And yeah. there may be somebody listening right now that says, hey, I don't love my husband. I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to walk away. Um, what would you say to that person right now that Ooh. is out there listening and saying, I'm just, you know, I just want a divorce. It's the easy way out. 
they cheated on me and I'm, I'm ready to go. But if the person's repetitive and they're changing, what, what can God do? You know? Oh my goodness. Yeah. (laughs) Actually, God is the only one that can do it. And God can change your heart. Mm -hmm. We can't change our own hearts, but if we'll give him permission, he will change our hearts. I used to hate my husband, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And he's very lovable. I was just in a very deceived (laughs) place, (laughs) but God, God took my heart. Like the Bible says, he takes the heart of the King and he turns it like a water course. And that's what he did for me. And he gave me a new heart in Ezekiel. He talks about, I will take out that heart of stone and I'll replace it with a heart of flesh that's pliable and moldable. And I'm a, I'm a walking testimony of that. And if he did it for me, he can do it for anybody. Amen. Amen. I believe that. Wow. What a powerful story. I, I, every time I hear your story, I'm inspired all over again all over. Uh, so I'm just so way about your story. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, that's what we're supposed to do is inspire one another, encourage one another, spur one another on and the Holy Amen. Spirit, encourage people, you know, Hey, you're going to make it. So if you're out there and you're listening today and you have been inspired by Allison's story and you're interested in going to the Selah retreat, um, all you have to do is go to her website. Can you tell us that website where they can go and sign up? Yes, it's Crosspoint Ministries. So it's Crosspoint without the E on the end. And ministries is plural. So crosspointministries.org. All right. So, and it's real um, easy to follow. It's like ABC and you just follow what's right there on the website. You can sign up. When is your next retreat, Allison? Well, we have a retreat October the 15th, but unfortunately that one is full And we have another retreat, November the 3rd, I think it is, but that one, and that one's only half full. Okay. Um, So that one is still available. I'm just making sure of the date. Let's see. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I'm sorry. It's November the 5th through the 8th. That one is not full yet. We only take the first 10 people who can pay their deposit. And that's how you save your bed. And then you pay the rest of it when you arrive. But we don't want... Uh, you know, the lack of funds to keep anybody away. So if you think you cannot afford $550, you talk to me personally and we'll work something out. Awesome. Awesome. So all you guys that are listening to us, we just want to thank you so much for joining the One Voice podcast. I want to encourage you that your voice is powerful and your story is powerful You need to tell somebody if you're going through something and ultimately the voice of God is the most powerful voice that you can listen to and he will make a difference in your life. So I want to encourage you to listen to what God is saying to you today and just lean into him. And if you need healing, you know, don't be ashamed, just run after it, run after healing and let all the shame go and let all the the accusations go and let all the lies go and just lean into God so you can be healed. It's not worth it. It's just not worth to hang on to those secrets and hang on to the pain of your past. And so I want to encourage you today just to run to him. He is waiting right there for you with his arms wide open. He wants to heal your marriage. He wants to heal your broken heart. He wants to heal um, your broken life, you know? He wants to heal brokenness. He was broken for you. So I I just want to encourage you to run to him. And he is a very present help in time Mm -hmm. of trouble. And he is right here for you. He is waiting for you. So um, we just want to say a prayer over you before we leave. And Allison, can you just say that for us? Can you just pray over those people? Pray a a prayer of healing over those that are listening. Um, Absolutely. I'd be honored to do that. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that your name is Jehovah Rapha. You are the great physician and your word promises us that you are near to the brokenhearted. And so God, right now, we just lift up every person within the sound of our voice. 
And God, we ask for the healing power of the Holy Spirit to touch them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. We thank you, Lord, that you say the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us and he's anointed us to bind up the brokenhearted and to set the captives free. And so, God, we thank you for that anointing right now, even flowing through this podcast to touch every broken heart in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And God, we just declare over each person that by the stripes of Jesus, they are healed. Amen. Thank you for that healing in yes. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining the One Voice podcast, and we will see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to One Voice Makes a Difference. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing and reviewing the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell your friends about One Voice too. Your voice helps the show reach more people to spread the gospel. Together, with all of our voices, we can come out of the darkness and into the light. If you'd like to hear more about Janet's personal story, you can purchase her book, One Voice, on her website, JanetSwanson.org. You can also connect with her on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. Most importantly, if you are in crisis, please call the 24-7 Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Don't wait. Your life matters.